But there's a classic movie that I like that I didn't like. I don't want it anymore. Oh. But it's called Gone with the Wind. Have any of you heard it? Never. Have you? <laughs> Come on now, I'm not that old. <laughs> anyway, I would make my son's walk. We <laughs> thought I would put some hot oil on them. <laughs> oh, sad. Only three, four hours. <laughs> but anyway. Believe it or not, Gone with the Wind is the title of my sermon this morning. <laughs> the message I have for you. The scripture text is this working for Timothy. Let's try it. Yes, it is. <laughs> and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, there were all of us one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound of a mind, uh, from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting. The Lord has chosen a number of different ways, different ways to illustrate the nature and the mission of the Holy Spirit. And with that, let's go before the Lord in prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, I ask, Lord God, I open up myself to you, Father God, to use me as a vessel, a vessel for you to use to glorify you. Bless this message. Bless the congregation, Lord. Open our hearts and minds to receive it. And I pray, Lord, they receive it as you have given it to me. And let it glorify you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Mm. See, the dove is the symbol used for peace, it's also used for gentleness. It's also used for purity and calm. Water symbolizes refreshing, washing, a cleansing. And it's satisfying. Fire is symbolic of purge. See, we don't like that part sometimes. When the Lord is purging, Burning off the dross. Get rid of the stuff that's not useful anymore. Or purifiers. Nobody will hear say, I want to go through it again. Do you? I don't think so. But it's needed. But wind, the wind, is a symbol that God chooses to show the active nature of the Holy Spirit. And we'll see this in Psalms. 139 and 7. Whether shall I go from thy spirit, or whether shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, Even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. We know here at Lady Lake about the power of the wind, don't we? We see it at first hand down there. Can you see the wind? Can you see that wind coming at you that night? You can't see where it's from, where it's going. The Lord directs the wind. But it's real, is it not? Amen. 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 So we associate wind with movement. And what great movement and force it has down there. We get some thunderstorms around here, and sometimes the winds are like 50 to 60 mile an hour. You look across, and your chairs are blowing across the yard. It's sweeping the rain across the road and you can't hardly see an inch in front of your car. And then you go a little farther and it's not there. Well, if you wait a little bit, it's calm. See, forcible wind precedes a storm and heavy rain. Although it is invisible, it has a unique way of letting us know it is there. Do we agree? Yeah, I think so. So why did God choose
statues win as the symbol of the unseen reality, the unseen reality of the Holy Spirit. Some can say because he's God and he can use what he wants. I always go with that one because that's the same one. God can do what he wants because he is the great I am. Amen. Who shall I say sent me? I am sent you. You can't argue with that. See, because of its, because of its unconfined reach in John, said the wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but can't tell where it cometh and whence it goeth. So everyone that is born of the Spirit. It's kind of futile at times to say or to confine the Holy Spirit. Yes, one can quench the Spirit. It grieves me when they do it, so I know it grieves God. Why would one want to quench the Spirit? Beyond me. Because the Spirit could do in two minutes what I couldn't do in six months. Amen? Amen? But believe it or not, there are Christians who walk this earth today or so-called Christians that are scared to death of the Holy Spirit. Amen. They're scared of it. Why? They can't see it. They can't see it. Man has to be tangible. We have to be able to touch everything. That's why the virus went crazy. We want to touch. You always have to touch. But they do touch. We as the grown into adults do the same thing, don't we? Yes, they always want to touch. So that's why I think they're afraid. Not to mention how we mess them up. Oh, they want that fear. But God's not a God of fear, is he? No, that's not a God. So if you fully trust him, like we learned in our Sunday school lesson this morning, those of you that missed it, you missed a good one. It talks about trusting the promises of God. If God promised it, it is, amen? Right. It is. So see, we can't figure out God either. You're not going to figure out the Holy Spirit. When you think you have it figured out, you will do it differently. So it's futile to try to confine it. He moves in another direction when you can't figure it out. You can't confine him to your life or your dislike. Oh my. Oh my. Oh me, oh my. We think we have control of God. I'm going to tell you something. You might want to break your chain. You have control of nothing. God has control of everything. Amen? Amen. So you can't confine him to your theologies either. You can go to the best seminaries in the world. <clears throat> but you cannot, cannot confine him to your way of thinking. You cannot keep him locked in a back room. Believe it or not, there's some churches in the past history that if you're moving and the Holy Ghost is moving upon you, they usher you to a room. Yep. Believe it or not, they usher you to a room. Why? Because you are disrupting. Your sermons that will trigger the gear ahead in advance. Sorry, I'm talking truth. I can guarantee you my sermons are not printed here in advance. But they would usher you to a back room. You cannot confine the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, to a back room. That's like trying to control the wind. That it won't blow across Lady Lake at all anywhere today. Can you do that? No. He reaches across boundaries and denominations. <clears throat> do you know where Pentecostalism started? With 
um, Justin, my back is freezing. Yep. Yep. Works hard, right, sister? Amen. That's why I like calling back the pastor. Because sometimes they've got this weird group more in there than if you're doing a church with us. It's hard to say at times. But it's true. But anyway, he reaches across denominations or movements. You cannot confine God. He reached into a prison where Paul and Silas were bound. It wasn't like Lake County Jail. It was the inner of the inner of the inner of the most filthy, dirty prison. God found him there. It said in Scripture, if I go to hell, you're there. If I go to heaven, you're there. North, south, east, west, he is there. Amen. You cannot confine him. Praise God. Hallelujah. I need him all the time. Amen. So he even reached over to Samaria where Philip was. He was having a revival. But perhaps the biggest and the most powerful move of the Holy Ghost is when he showed up in the upper room where the 120 were seated. You cannot confine him. You cannot confine him. He wants to reach you today. Are you open to it? Because of our unending reliability upon him, you and I can go weeks without food and days without water. You can go a lifetime without sight and sound. But you cannot go more than a few minutes without oxygen. Can you see it? No. But if you put your hand over your nose and your face and you can't breathe, you can sure know you don't have it. So it's a needed thing, is it not? I need the Holy Spirit when I get up in the morning. Yeah. I need God every part of my day. He is my strength, he is my strong tower, and he is my refuge. And I believe he's yours too, don't you? Yeah. Amen. So in Job 12, 10, in whose hand is of the life of every living thing, the breath of all mankind. I agree with that, don't you? He is the living thing. He is the soul of every living thing. The breath that you have in you is from the breath of God. Amen. Amen. He breathed into you and gave you life. It's amazing. In Acts 17, 25, it says, Nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything. Seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. Do you know why you were all created? So we can commune with each other, yes, we like that. We were created to worship God. Do you know that? You were created to worship God. And you know what? God has a backup plan. Because if you choose not to, the rocks and the trees will cry out to him. Amen. How about that? That's why we are his capstone of creation. So we can worship him and witness to one another and share our testimony. Our testimonies are powerful things and they're unique to you and you and you. God didn't say hide them under a basket or put them in a box in the cupboard. He wants you to shine with the bright and the light of God. He is the light of men. Do you know your words of testimony are powerful and there's people out there that need to hear them today? Amen. They're going through something that you might have gone through in the past that's very similar to what they're facing today. And they feel that there's no hope. And guess what? Without God, there is no hope. So they're not far off.
But if you share your testimony of what God's done for you in that kind of situation, what an uplifting and encouraging thing that is. Amen? Yes. Yes. It's kind of hard for someone to witness to somebody if they were not or ever in that situation. It's kind of hard. Because what will that person do? How do you know? You don't know that I'm faithful. If you haven't been in that situation, you can't say, well, I do, if you don't. What do you think? Do you think you'd be more valuable if you did witness to that person if you weren't in that situation? That's why God allows us to go through different trials and tribulations in our lives. To share with one another and encourage with one another. Share your testimony, church. Share it. Let's look at another one here. I didn't write every one down. Acts 2, 7. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? Wow. Job 33 and 4 says, The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. That breath that he gave you, that wind that he blew into you, can you see it? Again, I say no. Well, if you want to test God, bag and see how long you can go without it. It won't be long. Like I said, you can go without food for a week. Water, day, air, three to four minutes and brain damage starts. Am I right, Carson? Yes. So in Genesis, it said that, and the Lord God formed man on the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living thing. I just think that's amazing. Because that's something that God himself imparted to us. That ought to make you jump a little. That's something God imparted of himself to you. The dust. Yes, we're all different vessels. None better than others. Right. When we die, we're all going to become dust again. But it's what that dust that God formed us and breathed into us. Why? Because He loves you. He loves us. The marked distinction between animals and man is what? The breath of God. That's the marked distinction. See, when God created the earth, he simply spoke the animals into existence and they breathed. He spoke them into existence. But how did man come? He formed him carefully out of the dust of the ground. His hands were physically molded. And then he breathed into us to give us the breath of life. He loved us that much. Because, yes, yeah, he's God. He could have spoke us into existence. Right. Like the animals, but he didn't. He didn't. And a lot of times when we read the scriptures, do we really absorb what God is telling us? Glory. Do we really get what he's saying? Or are they just words on a page? They're not. And yes, we get tangled up in things of life. How many of you get the kids out to school and one running a little late this morning and we kind of dipped in our prayer life and our reading time with God? And you might not really absorb what you read. That's why each time you read and you read and you read, God will reveal something new each and every time. And you'll say, I've read that I know at least ten times when I'm different. 
Because God said you weren't ready to receive that. Now you are. That's why it's called the living word. It's alive. It's alive. Give my hand back of praise. It's alive. He's worthy. Jesus was the word made flesh for you and I. Glory. Jesus is the word of God. Wow. See, Psalms 51 and 11 said, there he is, cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. We have the very breath of God within us. And I think sometimes we forget that. The enemy sure wants you to forget about it. He'll get you all twisted up and discombobulated and think, you know, that you forget about it. And at times, in reality, we do. In Ezekiel's vision of the Valley of Dry Bones, this speaks volumes. This speaks volumes. Son of man, can these bones live? Thus saith the Lord God to these bones, Surely I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. God began to breathe the bones that were resurrected into an army. Ezekiel in 37.10 said, So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great army. They did, they came alive. Well, guess what's missing? The spirit. That's going to come. This is Israel. It's going to come. If God said it, it is. Amen? See, when Jesus was getting to go, get ready to go back into heaven, the Bible says that when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. That's when he was ascending into heaven. Without air the spirit, we are lifeless. We must have him. The problem some of us have is that we are living on stale air. The best air gets stale at some point. Have any of you smelled stale air before? You can't see it, but you walk in the room and it's stale. It's stale. Like an old shed or old room in a house, an old home. It gets stale. But before you can take in a new breath, there has to be what? An exhaustion of your old air so you can suck in new air. It's simple. Concept, out, in. Out, in. Do you think about that breath every minute of your life? No, we do it automatically, don't we? Out, in. Out, in. But if you come to a point in your life where it's hard to get that air with some disease processes, believe me, you will take note of when you can't get it. When you can't simply do that out and in, as in cystic fibrosis or pulmonary edema, COPD, emphysema. Then you know when you're not getting that air. You can't get that stale air out. If you can't get it out, you can't rebuild it. So then you really take note. See, the Holy Spirit has brought to us many things. Peace, comfort, how about joy and gentleness? But there are some things that were dismissed out of the lives of the 120 when the Holy Spirit came into the upper room. What did the wind of the Spirit go away? Inconsistencies. Is God inconsistent? Mm -hmm. If you have faith in him, and he says that he will do. Right. He's not fulfilling some promises, but no, I'm not going to fulfill that one. I need to take this quote off. I'm going to go. See, inconsistency. What are we inconsistent? 
Jesus lived with. And he left here to build his church. Was Peter always persistent? No. Doubting Thomas? There is one thing that we can say about Peter. He wasn't afraid to try. Lord, can I come out there on the water with you? Come. How about that? Did anybody else get out the boat one of But he left a group of 12 that had faults in them. But he left those 12 to build his church. Peter was confessing Christ one minute and denying him the next. That was inconsistent. But Jesus said unto him, No one, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. How about that? He said that in Luke 9, 62. If we let that sink in a minute, this is why the windshield of our car is bigger than the rearview mirror. Amen? If we were to look at life constantly in the past, then the past would be in the front. But Jesus said, no, you don't look back. We talked about looking back this morning with Lot, with Sodom and Gomorrah. I said, don't look back. So, but the wife had to take one last look of things she was leaving for her fault. Temper. Peter cut off the ear of the high priest's servant's ear. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off the right ear. The, names, the servant's name was Malchus. John 3, 18. Let's see how far I'm at. James and Hong, the sons of thunder. Have you heard of the sons of thunder? These ain't some race cars. This is in Mark 3.17. Wanted to burn up those who wouldn't believe. And when his disciples, James and John, saw how this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? How about jealousy? You ever see Christians jealous of one another? Some of them, but it's true. See, these men were the most competitive men in the Bible. All wanted that first shot. Do you think they looked at John when he leaned his head on Christ's breast? On his chest? Yeah. But he was the beloved. He was also the youngest. Do you think they were competitive? Let's look here. What side of you do we sit on, Lord, they asked. They saw John leaning against Jesus one day, and Peter said, what about him? If you have children, you hear that frequently. What about him? What about her? I didn't do it, not me. Not me. I don't know about you, if you raise children, not me to live in your house. They're invisible like the wind, but they move through and cause chaos. Because if you ask the children, what happened? Not me. Not me, it wasn't me. Nope. And we often say, well, let me find that not me. He's going to get spanked. <laughs> Never found it. Did we? Timidity. Being timid. Do you think the disciples were timid? After the Holy Ghost? They were baptized with the Holy Ghost, they were timid no more. Before Pentecost, they were not bold enough to even witness. But they were sure bold enough after Pentecost to tell 3,000, you crucified Jesus. I think that took some nerve. The Holy Spirit, the breath flowing from God, that wind that you cannot see. When they were in the upper room, they heard that rushing, mighty wind. But did they see it? No. But they'd seen the cloven fire, tongues of fire upon their head. And they were speaking in tongues to drink at the other tongues of nations they didn't even know. But that power, that force, before Pentecost, they couldn't witness that Jesus said, 
Shortly after Pentecost, they were able to witness. That's what Jesus sent them out. We need that gone with the wind experience. Have you had a gone with the wind experience? It's powerful. Without it, they were ineffective. Have you ever had any that was ineffective? It just didn't work. It's not effective. You go to doctors about something and he gives you a medicine and it's not working. Supposedly, well, it's not. Here's why we're not cookie cutters. What medicine may work one work well for one may not work well for another. That's why they call it practice. They're not done by no means. God gave them that knowledge. I'm not discrediting it. But what way work for one may not work for another? They were ineffective. They could not cast the devil out of the little boy. Why? Because they just didn't have the power. The authority. After Pentecost, they raised a lamb, a lame man. They got him up. How about money? Gold, silver? Gold, silver, I don't remember what I had. I was Hebrew. They got that lame man up and he walked. Walk. Are we effective? Are we effective Christians? We need to, that precious gift that God gave us, are we bundling in it? If you are, you're plugging the overflowing of the Holy Spirit. Do you know that? He wants to fill you, but he doesn't want just to fill you and stop. He wants to fill you. You got to pour it out. Fill me again. Pour it out. Fill me up. Pour it out. That's what he wants. That's the effectiveness of the Holy Spirit. Be a contagious Christian. Amen. Contagious. It's power in you from on high. Gone with the wind. How about it? So what can we learn from this? Well, we learn of there's plenty of illustration and experience that we see from before Pentecost to the after Pentecost, the difference in the 12 disciples themselves. We are where we are today because of the 12 disciples. Did you know that? The word of God spread. The power of the Holy Ghost, that Holy Spirit, that wind, that rushing mighty wind. God causes the wind to blow. It causes the trees to sway. They may lean palm trees, but they won't break. You see them half bend over like almost a C shape. But they're not broken. See, with the power of God is still, we may end up in bending. But we won't break. And if you feel like you're breaking and falling apart, we have one. Whoa, there is one. Can you feel it? There is one. His name is Jesus. And the Holy Spirit says, testifies of Jesus the Christ. Glory. Glory. Can you imagine if everybody walked with God? Guess what? There's coming a day when that new Jerusalem comes down from heaven. As pastors have been crying on board, trains pulling out, but the Antichrist is moving in. He must be powerful, the Holy Ghost, because the Antichrist can't come until he who led and he is the Holy Ghost of God. Hallelujah. Give him a hand clap of praise. Jesus sent him. He said, I will go, but I will send the comforter to come to you. He said, I will send him to comfort you, to uplift you, to energize you. That's what the Holy Ghost of God does. 
he energizes you. Yeah. Are you energized? No. These batteries may fail, but God never fails. God never fails. He is the wind. He is the Holy Spirit. To be gone with the wind. I'd rather be gone with the wind than just sitting there rotting. Because that's what happens if you don't take the word of God and spread it. You're letting it rot. God didn't intend that to happen. He saved you for a purpose. He saved you. He called you out of that darkness into marvelous light for a reason. Are you holding it to yourself? We don't light a candle to put it under a basket where no one can see. You're called to be light into the darkness. You're called to be salt into the earth. You're called to be witnesses of the God Almighty. God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You were called. What are you doing? I want us to be an infectious that the virus can go around. Why can't we go around? Why can't we go around? You see the difference in the disciples before Pentecost and after Pentecost. Where do you think they were more effective? Before or after? Amen. Amen. If you want to be gone with the wind, and have the breath of God just flow in and out of you. Like the oxygen in every breath you take. You can just come stand to your feet. If you want more of God, stand where you are. If you want to be effective, stand where you are. If you want to be baptized with the Holy Ghost, stand where you are. Just ask. Ask and it shall be given you. He's got so many gifts for us. And we as Christians, I don't know if we're trying to be polite or what. We just want a small portion. God says, no, let me hear that whole heap of potato on there. Let me just give you a spoon, but I'm going to give you a whole pot. That's what God wants for his children. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is infected. Be gone with the wind, Christian. Don't be stale air of a dense old shed or an old room at a house. Be affected. Be infected. He loves you that much that, like I said, he personally, with his hand, formed you. He could have spoke to you, but no, he formed you. And then he wasn't done. He let the breath of God breathe into you. He wants you to be infectious. Give him glory, church. He's worthy. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Glory, glory, glory.
You can never praise Him in that church. You can never praise Him. You can never praise Him in that church. And if you want more of what He has for you, come back here tonight.